Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together, isn't it? Amen. Good morning. My name is Kim, and I get to serve on the team here. And just want to say welcome to everyone that's here. And also, if this is your first time here and you're a visitor, we're grateful that you joined us, and we hope you enjoy the service today. And we have a gift for you out in the foyer. Uh, there's no weird, weird people out there. They're not going to hound you or anything. They, we just genuinely want to give you a sweet gift. So please make your way out to the foyer after service, and they'll get that for you. Um, you know, we're living in a kind of a unique time right now. I guess that goes without saying. It's like the obvious thing. And... And I'm grateful for the red letters, and I mean the whole Bible, but, you know, the red letters of Jesus speaking because they really are strengthening. And even if you have, you know, so much scripture memorized, it's so good to be reminded, isn't it? So I want to just read some things to help strengthen us this morning. And I'm reading out of John, and I'm going to read in two places. And it says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So we shouldn't be surprised when opposition happens to the church, right? That was Jesus kind of warning us and letting us know that our loyalty to him would cause problems. But then to kind of counter that is love. Um, I think it was a couple weeks ago uh, my husband John and Dan and I were standing in the foyer and we were talking and we were looking at the brave-hearted men's group and thinking about names for the women's groups and and I just thought, well, yeah, I love that because the opposite of fear is courage. And Dan said, actually, it's kind of a step further. It's love. And I thought, mm, that's right. Yes, thank you. And I was reminded of that because if you love somebody... You will, it won't be hard to find the courage to protect them. It won't be hard to tell the truth. Does that make sense? And so love is actually the opposite of fear. And that's why, you know, the Lord said, you know, perfect love casts out all fear. So he says a, a new commandment. So in addition to the Ten Commandments, this is Jesus saying, it, I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's amazing that literally we will be known as Jesus' disciples by how we love one another. So let's pray before we get together to worship, okay? Father, I thank you for your great love. And I ask for that love to fill our hearts today and that it would just remain and just churn within us, Lord. And that we would be able to have interactions with others out of the out and overflow of the love that you have for us. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, into this service. And we say yes and amen to the promises of God over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand as you are able as we worship the Lord. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strains. Glory. Come to bed. 
angels sing. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis day. this song so much, not only because it acknowledges the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was just so important to not leave any of those out, but it, because it's a declaration song. If you notice, it's a declaration statement to say, I believe. That's so powerful. 
And I think that it's good to note that it's more powerful than we even get a credit for. And so, you know, I'm thinking about that word declaration and the, the song and the, and the things that it does and that it, that it builds in us and it should encourage us and strengthen us. And I think about the power of a declaration, like the Declaration of Independence and what that did for our nation. And literally, it was, what, a piece of paper? Some ideas put together and put on a piece of paper, but how many can tell that it takes some work and it takes some action to implement a declaration? There's work behind it. There's things that you have to do to make that happen, or it's just a piece of paper, or it's just a word. And as we look at Psalm 139, I've been, I've been studying and reflecting on this for the last few years, and I think there's a nugget in there for us right now. And I think it's really timely, and I think it's really important. And it talks about how God formed us. He thought about us first. And then he wrote a book about us. It's all in there. You can fact check me. And then he put us in our mother's womb. So that means he thought what your gift was going to be. He thought what your personality was going to be. He knew who your family was going to be. And you were born for this generation in this generation to serve and to minister this generation. And so I want to exercise a spiritual muscle today, if you would humor me, and be willing to pray after me, and we can pray together, because it's so important that we recognize that with all the distractions of life, all the things that are happening, that we literally have purpose and plan. Our days are written down. It doesn't matter if you believe it or not for it to be true. It's still true. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that is exactly what God has for me. And I have to do this weekly and pray it weekly. But if you'll be willing to just humor me this morning and pray after me, and if you want to engage with it and have the courage to do that, I'm grateful for that. And if you don't want to do it, will you just do it out loud to strengthen your brother or sister next to you? Even to the people that are joining us online, just join together. Okay, just repeat after me. Father, I thank you that you made me on purpose, that you wrote a book about me before I was even in my mother's womb. And Father, I repent for not engaging with those things. And Father, in Jesus' name, I renounce everything that the devil has tried to do to steal those things, to hinder those things, and hide those things from me in Jesus' name. And I declare right now, in Jesus' name, that there is a book about me. And I agree and I declare that those promises are true. And Father, I ask that you would ignite the fire in me once again. And I acknowledge that revival begins with me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's sing what we believe. I believe in a life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion. And in your holy church, I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Sing, we believe. We believe in God our Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three. For I believe in the name. 
and the power that it holds and the love that it holds. Amen. All right, to share her testimony, I would now like to welcome up my beautiful fiance, Lainey Butler. He did all of that with me for getting his water bottle this morning on a dry throat, so very proud. Hi, my name is Lainey. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I work here. I do our social media, among a few other things. And today I get to share with you how God has worked in my life. Is, is this working? Is this on? Okay. Um, but before I do that, I would love to begin in prayer. So if you'll join me. Dear God, I just pray over this time we get to have together. Lord, I just pray that you will speak through me and that my words will be from you and not from me, that you'll open our ears to your words, Jesus, in your name, amen. So like many of you, I grew up in a Christian home. Thanks, mom and dad, they're right there. Um, very blessed to do that. And because of that, I don't have this one moment where like before and after what my life was like before Jesus or after Jesus. Jesus has always been kind of a part of my life. And I've loved Jesus ever since I was a little girl. I told this story in the first service, but I'll tell it again. Um, when I was in elementary school, I went to a Gig Harbor football game because I grew up in Gig Harbor, and I gathered up the little kids who were at the football game, and I asked them, do you know where you're going when you die? <laughs> and then I told them about Jesus, and that is not the best way to evangelize, but it's always been in there. It's always been in my heart. As I moved into high school, I think that would be a time where I was most distant from him, not in the sense that I didn't believe in him or I fell away. I just don't think my life was 100% for Jesus serving him. And so as I moved into college and as co college was approaching, I began to see and feel how heavily the Lord was pursuing me. And I had a great plan. Um, I was talking to Dr. Adams this week, and he said, if you want to tell God a funny joke, you tell him about your plans, and he'll laugh. And that's exactly what happened to me. I got a scholarship to California Baptist University. I was going to study business. That summer, my best friend, Anna, and I, we were going to go to Europe. And then God called me to the theology program in Spokane, and I I canceled all of that, the schooling, the trip, everything to do this theology program. And my parents didn't understand at first, but I know they understand now. Um, and that's how it is with God sometimes. And we don't understand his plans. And that summer, I did not understand how me dropping everything would work for good. That summer I was baptized, that summer I learned that the Old Testament is important, it's not just the New Testament, it's both. And then that summer led me into Christian housing up in Seattle instead of in California where I met my best friend and where I went on this mission trip to the Dominican Republic, which is kind of a big part of my story today. So I raised money to go on this mission trip it was quite expensive, and I was in this kind of dry season where I was starting to wane from the high of what I'd learned during this theology program this summer. I didn't have a church community, and I was like, okay, this mission trip, this is it. This is where I'll reconnect with God. This will fix everything, and I'm on my way there. We have a layover in New York. We are in the line. We're boarding. And I reach into the pocket of my backpack where I kept my passport, and it is completely empty. And I am 18, terrified of being in New York by myself. One young lady decides to stay behind with me, bless her. And then I watched the airplane with the 60 other people I was supposed to go to the Dominican Republic with fly off without me. And we looked everywhere. My brother went to SeaTac to go try to find my passport. My passport was nowhere to be found. My mentor called me when I was in the hotel at New York, and she said, I want you to open your Bible right now and read Romans 8. 
And for those of you who don't know, Romans 8 has a verse that says, God makes all things work together for the good of his people. I'm like, how can me raising this much money and then losing my passport and not being able to go on a mission trip work together for good? I do not understand it. I was very upset right after I read that. Um, I got a phone call that the plane I was on from Seattle to New York had just landed and my passport was not on it. So I booked a flight back to Seattle. Krista, the woman who decided to stay with me, booked another flight to the Dominican Republic. And that was that. And I am just staring at my Bible. I'm like, how can you make this work together for your good? I'm livid. So the next morning, Krista and I packed up our bags and uh, I say to her, okay, Krista, I want you to take my Bible to the Dominican Republic with you. I want it to go in place of me and her mouth drops. And she goes, Lainey, look in your Bible, look in your Bible, look in your Bible. So I look at my Bible and my passport is in my Bible. And I got to go to the Dominican Republic. It changed my life. I decided to become a part of the church community that that mission trip was with, which I wasn't a part of before. And I met Braden through that church community. (laughs) And so much good has come from that trip and that moment in my life. And when I got back from the Dominican Republic, all these churches in Seattle, they hear like, oh, this girl found a passport in her Bible. She has to come speak. So I spoke at a few different churches in Seattle. I'm walking home from one, and I'm just overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, just like, God, I feel like I need to change. I need to do something different with my life. And Capernary Bible School pops in my head. Okay, that's weird. Lord, what do you want me to do with that? Two hours later, I went to a seminar by Richard Dahlstrom called God's Calling on Your Life. He steps up there to start the seminar, and he goes, someone in this room is called to Cape Ray Bible School. I broke down in tears. I knew it was me. Two hours before, the Lord had told me that. And so I started to apply. I started to get ready to go, and I started to pray about it more. And I think this would be the biggest part of my story, because at, when God calls us to something, he doesn't always pave the way for us. And it's the Lord's job to call us, but it's our job to listen. And it's the enemy's job to distract. So when I'm on this path to Bible school, the enemy distracted me in so many different ways. Honestly, I don't care to go into the details, but it was the worst time in my life leading up to Bible school. That Christian community, I lost so many friends, some terrible things happened, and still I'm wondering how God can make good out of this. So I'm on my way to Bible school, and I make this prayer, Lord, make me different. And for some reason, I haven't figured this out yet. God has so heavily pursued me, taught me so much, but I haven't figured out that when I pray to God, he doesn't go, bippity boppity boo oh, Lainey, you're Cinderella, you're glowing. I just give this to you, new puppy, new car. No, that's not how God works. But I ha- still hadn't figured it out yet on my way to Bible school. So I prayed, make me different. And in John 15, it says, he cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. My time at Bible school, the Lord cut off so many branches in my life that bared no fruit, and it was painful, and that's how our God changes us. He takes parts of our lives that we think are good, but he knows can't bear fruit for us anymore, and he prunes them, and he makes them better, and here I think, I'm so small to think that I have any power in changing my life because I know the Lord is the only one who has power in changing my life. And that time at Bible school is really a wilderness for me. I met someone there who was my roommate. She worked on a vineyard. She told me that the best wine and the best grapes grow out of the roughest ground. Felt like my 
most vulnerable learning about the Lord was during that time in the wilderness while I was there. The Lord grows us and he changes us in our wilderness season so that we can thrive for him. I got back from Bible school and it was COVID. And I think at the end of our testimony, there is this temptation to say, and I lived happily ever happier after. Now that Jesus in my, is in my life, now that I'm following him, now that I'm following this book, everything's great and I'll live happily ever after and I know he'll make good out of this. But 2020 hasn't been happily ever after for me or anyone else in this room, I don't think. And I encourage all of you to know that even though it's hard to see, God is working in this season. I was listening to Rescue by Lauren Daigle on the way here. And she sings, I will send out an army to find you. If you know the passage of the lost sheep, how God leaves the 99 to find the one. And if you're sitting there wondering, why isn't God pursuing me? How come I don't have this moment of God's calling on your life? I don't know, but I do know from all of this that it is the enemy's job to distract us. And if you don't see God pursuing you, the enemy is probably distracting you with something else, with some branch on you that's not growing fruit anymore. God has changed me in so many wonderful ways. I am still struggling. I am still learning. But I'm here, and I'm worshiping. And if I could leave you with anything, I would say that he loves you. Nothing is greater in this adventure of a life than knowing the sweet, good love of Jesus. And even though 2020 has been hard, and even though the pruning and the cutting off of branches and things in our life that we think are good, it's hard. It is worth it because our Savior takes what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it to good. I'm going to end in prayer. Dear God, I just pray for every person in this room, Lord. I pray for a time of reflection, God. You'll help us with gratitude from what we have learned this year, God. Give us time for grievance of what we've lost this year, Lord. I pray that you'll change every person in this room only how you know how to change them. We love you, Jesus, and we want to open our hearts up to you. In your name, amen. The world waits for a miracle The heart longs for a little bit of hope Oh, come Oh, come, Emmanuel. A child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of hurt. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And can
hopes for a little bit of hope, oh come, oh come, Emmanuel. I just want to say thank you to all of our musicians. They're led by Annie Carlson, who plans all this every week and rehearses. And um, <laughs> and our, our first group, we had Annie on the keyboard and Braden on the vocals and Andrea playing the violin. It's just awesome. And um, Kaylin Creaser, holy smokes, that last one, just, whew, that's super powerful. And I was telling... Um, Kim down here early, early, just a second ago, it's like the best part about it is with all of them, because I know them all, it's all genuine. It's not performance-based, if that makes sense. Do you, you follow what I'm saying? That this isn't just a, a musical performance, it's genuine praise of God. It's authentic. I mean, you could go to some of these glitzy places, and even there's some churches that are like that, right? They're, they're glitzy, and you, ha you could find great performers, but that's just, that's just what it is. It's performing. And we're not in the business of performance here. <laughs> um, we're in the Jesus business. And we're in the Jesus changing people's lives business, which isn't a business at all. Uh, and that's what, that's, that's the mission of our churches is, is, if you could boil it down to basically one phrase, it's, it's life change. It's not giving people information. It's not even inspiration. It's life change. And if life change isn't happening, then that means that we need to think about what we're doing here and how we're doing it. Because the God, God and Jesus Christ, if you look at Jesus Christ, through the four Gospels with the people that he encountered, the business of Jesus Christ was profound life change. So that's, we're following our crucified and risen master, and we are under his orders, and we say yes, sir, to him. We don't, we don't, we don't ask questions, we say yes, sir. Um, we don't even ask, we, you know, people that have been walking for the Lord for a while, I don't even need an explanation. I just need, I just need a direction. And, and we say yes, sir, to Jesus. That's it. We're continuing our series called In the Beginning, which is we're just going through the 18 verses, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John, who some have said some of the most beautiful language that has ever been written. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking about Jesus, this Word, this thing for which, uh, who Jesus is, the, the Greek word logos, the, th that he is the purpose of the universe, he's the purpose of your life. I mentioned in that sermon a couple of weeks ago that it was Blaise Pascal followed up by C.S. Lewis that said, all of us are born. Now think about this. I was sharing this with, um, uh, I don't know if I should say this. Ah, what the heck. Um... I was visiting uh, with a member of the military a couple days ago who was going through some extreme difficulty and, you know, had questions about himself and his future and um, maybe even questioned whether life was worth the living. And th this lit him up, and it's so Holy Spirit. I, I said to him, um, do you know uh, the Bible talks about it, and then some other philosophers, theologians have picked up on it, but it's really from the Bible. And it's John 1.1. 1, 1. The Logos is the, the purpose, the, what we're designed for, what we're supposed to be living for. I said, did you know that um, you've heard of C.S. Lewis, and usually anyone, I don't even care if they're, they're, they don't believe in the Lord or have never read their Bible. You say C.S. Lewis, and, and people still know him. Isn't that interesting? Like, is there anyone in this room? Well, you're from Emmanuel, you're, you're biased, and you, you've been washed with C.S. Lewis for years if you've been here going here for a while. But anyone here who's never heard of C.S. Lewis? Uh, probably the most famous convert of the 20th century, and then he was an enemy of the faith and then became the most prolific defender of the faith and Christian writer of the whole 20th century. 
um, Lewis said we are born, he took this from Pascal, Blaise Pascal. So if any of you hate calculus, you could blame Pascal because he was a mathematician that invented a form of calculus. But he was also a person who walked passionately and devoutly with Jesus. They, they contended, and they got this from John 1, that we are all born, think about this now, with a God-shaped, they said vacuum, but I didn't, when I think of vacuum, I think of like going through my, you know, the, with, <laughs> what's a vacuum? A, a, a space, right? A, a, think of it this way, a God-shaped hole that's meant to have, if it's God-shaped, that means it's meant to have God there. And this is at the center of your being. And this vacuum or this hole or this gap in our soul is hungry because it, (laughs) there's one theologian that said, when you try and put things in that place where God should be, it doesn't fit right. It rattles around because it doesn't, it can't fit. God's the only one that fits it perfectly. And and God leaves, and Jesus leaves real big stretch marks. And so when you put something in there that's not as big as God, what happens? It rattles around. Like with my life, I tried to put sports in there. And I thought sports would be the answer to satisfy the hunger from the, the God-shaped vacuum or the God-shaped hole. I was wrong. It rattled around. And I always thought, well, if I could just get to varsity or if I could just get to college or if I could just get on the field, you know, these things. And it was the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Some of you have done it with relationships. It's like, it's just, it's, you're putting relationships in there and you're saying, oh, well, that didn't work. It rattles around because it can't fit, oh, fit there. Only Jesus fits it, and so it rattles around, and it rattles around. You're like, okay, so I just need another boyfriend. Ringing true out there, any of you ladies? Or I just need another one of these. Or I just need a, the, next, the next degree, or the next house, or the, a better car, or the next promotion. And each time, I just need a little bit more money. Who was it? I, I love this quote. You've heard me say it before if you've been here for a while. Nelson Rockefeller. How much money does a man need to feel content? just a little bit more. There is no number. That, that he, you know what he's doing unbeknownst to himself? He's talking about the God-shaped hole that's there. And so I told this guy, I said, did you know that that's there? And he was, he was really, really distraught over a girl that had um, been dating for a while, and she just abruptly uh, broke up with him. And, you know, anyway, Ernest Becker was right. The love partner is going to become the idol of the American culture. He said that in 1972, and it has arrived. When I first went in the Navy and I was serving with the Marines, um, the, most of the people that visited my office, the chaplain's office, were dealing with PTSD due to warfare, seeing things in war. Now people that come into my office express suicidal ide- ideations or an expression of suicide based upon relationship loss. That inter- it, and it's almost exclusively that. Not even career or anything. It's relationships. It's she cheated on me, he left, all that stuff. And what does that tell you? We've tried to stuff boyfriends and girlfriends and husband and wives into this hole and it's not fitting properly. And it doesn't help to move on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. until it, You can keep doing that. You can keep being restless and following that track until you're four score or over or earlier. And you could be miserable your whole life. And furthermore, do you know what miserable people do? They make other people miserable. <laughs> That's why there's the adage, misery loves Company, the, the miserable people are the greatest evangelists you could possibly see, but they're evangelizing misery, not Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to have God there? So I'll give you Lewis. Lewis had a word that he used to describe. I'm totally off my script right now, too, and that's okay. The Holy Spirit just blew me over here. But Lewis had a word he used to describe what it means when that that vacuum gets filled. He, he even said, like, imagine, if you, imagine that hole's an engine, and it's meant to be run on a particular type of fuel, let's say unleaded gasoline. What would happen if you put diesel gasoline into your car, and it's not meant to run on it? I mean, it'd run for a little bit, but it, you'd probably break it, and it would break down. If you follow? Or if you tried to put orange juice in it, it's not going to work. Why? Because you're putting the wrong fuel in it. And so Lewis says, imagine your engine or is, is, your, is your, your soul, your spirit, and it's, and it's you're putting the wrong fuel in it. You're putting, you're putting athletic achievement in it. You're putting academic achievement. You're putting relationships into it. And it'll, 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 and then it'll break down. 
That's what's happening with your life because you don't have the logos. You don't have the thing you're designed to be in relationship with that's supposed to be there. <laughs> and so this guy, when I expressed this to him, this, this uh, member of the mill, this Marine, was utterly transfixed with that. And I, he says, I've never heard it like that before. And I would have liked to have taken credit. But it's the Bible. <laughs> and my sinful self wants to take credit for that. And it's, it's the Bible, and it was Pascal, or St. Augustine. Luther talked about it. Go read Luther's, Martin Luther's large catechism, the first commandment, where Luther talked about what is it. We are to fear and love God. Uh, I'm the Lord your God. We should have no other God except, except for me. That's the first commandment, right? and not make any graven images. That is idols. And what does the Bible say when you elevate something into that position of preeminence in the heart or in the soul? The Bible calls that an idol. And we don't, that language rings a little hollow with us because we think of an idol as a statue that you bow down to. And that's not what the Bible talks about. When it speaks about idols, it talks about things that you've devoted your heart to, that you've given your life over too much. The, the scripture uses a word for the things of this world like, like we've been describing. It's um, the Greek word for desire is thumia, and then it says, Paul uses a, an add-on to it, epithumia, you've over-desired. See, it's not wrong to desire ath- academic success or athletic success or, or to achieve at your work or to have a great marriage. Those things are not wrong. But they, what happens when we over-desire them? What happens? St. Augustine, uh, f- fourth century bishop of Hippo, one of my favorite historical figures of all time, and by the way, uh, a figure that we are most devoted to in Western culture because he has shaped all the categories of the way we think in Western culture, and we don't even know it. They're still reading in in philosophy courses at universities to this day. They're still reading St. Augustine's City of God. Probably not the Confessions, but City of God. He's still read. Is anyone going to read you 1,800 or 1,600 years from now? The answer is no. Um, or anyone else practically. So he's influential. And um, St. Augustine uh, spoke, spoke to this. Um, Epithumia, he said, he defined sin very, very interestingly. He said it was a disordered love. I was like, what does that mean? Well, he, he's right. He says, if you think about it, if let's say I as a dad, I love my career and I value it, I don't say this with my mouth, but it's actually where my heart is. See, no one cares what your mouth says unless it's a true expression of your heart. So that's why the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. See, the Bible's after the heart. So St. Augustine said sin, he defined it as not so much of a screw-up as disordered love. So if I as a dad love my career functionally, I would never say this with my mouth, but you'll find a lot of pastors that try and save themselves through their ministry if their ministry is successful or if they pack great crowds and they feel like, you know, not that any of those things are wrong, but saving yourself through them is. You'll find a lot of that. And it's a great temptation of this calling is to try and find justification through it instead of through the crucified and risen Jesus. Hmm. But let's say I, have a, I, as a dad, value my career functionally in my heart. Again, I'd never say that. Over my role as a father of my children. That's disordered, correct? Everyone, nod your head. I know we live in a capitalistic society, and I'm all for it. I'm a full-throttle capitalist. Just because of the dreadful alternatives. But, and and it's, a, it's a pain to know history, to know the, what the dreadful alternatives are, because they're very clearly dreadful. But that's not right correct? If I valued my job more. And what do you think is going to happen as a result of that? My kids are going to get warped. It's going to screw them up in some capacity or at some degree. And they're going to try and then inevitably what begins to happen is they try and overcompensate in other areas for attention that they should have received from their father and they never got. And they're going to overcompensate in other areas. Maybe it's, maybe it's in relationships. Maybe it's in sports. Maybe you, you have to play football, basketball, and baseball because of your dad. I've coached a lot of kids like that at Bellarmine. Not a lot, but it's some. You know, they don't want to be out there, but their dad wants them. And, they're, they're, and, and they know that it would make their dad proud who never showed them affection and so they overcompensate. Or you could do with all sorts of things. See, Augustine calls that disordered love. And he says, in anything you take, 
If this is God, anything you take and you put it above God, Augustine would call that sin. It's disordered. Notice I didn't describe a, behavior, a rule being broken or a behavior because that's not how the Bible defines it. Those are sins, but they spring from the original one, the disordered love. Make sense? And he calls anything above God is an idol. And then he said, this was in the Confessions. If you haven't read that, please read that before you die. St. Augustine said, and idols, name one that's tempting you or has tempted you in your past, and idols always break your heart. They always break your heart. Because inevitably, they're going to be performance-based. You know what I'm saying? It's not hard to see how athletics is performance-based. It's not hard to see how academics is performance-based. It's not hard to even see how relationships can be performance-based. Like, come on. Like, look at what we do before we go out on, you know, you got a big date. Look at what you do. I mean, you get, get the haircut, comb it over, throw some gel in it, got to be glued up there. Um, get the night, get your, uh, you know, nice clothes on sweater. What are you doing? It's performance-based. I'm even doing it today. This isn't how I normally dress. Since during the pandemic, I've been dressing like a high school PE teacher for, my, uh, for the last couple weeks. And I drive a truck like one, right, Jeremy? <laughs> uh, I love my truck. Um, but see what I'm saying? It's like inevitably almost every facet of life is performance-based. And when you're basing your identity and your import and who you are on your performance, do you know what's going to happen? One of two things. And this is scary. I mean, it really is. You're either going to succeed and be the best, and it's going to make you do what? Look at other people and say, I did it, why can't you? And you become a hubristic piece of garbage who's a narcissist and constantly putting your nose up in the air and putting your nose down at other people. But let's say, what's the second option then? You fail. And you fall into the dirt and you say, I've never been good, I can't, I never will, I'm terrible, Um, nobody loves me, nobody cares. Performance-based will always leave you there. But what if I could tell you that there's one thing that wants to go, this is what I was telling this guy too, this Marine, what if there's one thing that could go there that's not performance-based? What if I could tell you that there's one thing that doesn't, um, that doesn't give you relationship, career, success, money, or influence, addiction. Because what does the gospel do? Here comes something completely foreign, the gospel message. My, Gerhard Ferdy, my teacher at Luther Seminary, he said, uh, one, on one of the first lecture, he said the gospel isn't, um, you got to look at it, is not, is not contrary to the pharisaical laws and, and hypocrisy of the Pharisees in Jesus' day in first century Judaism, it is that. He says, the gospel runs contrary to everything and every facet and every philosophy of life. Everything. Because what does the gospel come along and say? You're so bad, we're so far off that look at what Jesus Christ had to do for you. Convicting, right? Drives you low. And then what does it say? But he did it for you. <laughs> huh? But he lo- look at his, how great the Father's love is, Scripture tells us, right? Look at this. So what does it do? It humbles you in the best way to be humbled, and it lifts you at the same time. You know what Martin Luther called us? We'll get a little Latin today. We, did, we sang a little Latin earlier uh, in Excelsis Deo. But here, we'll, Luther's Latin phrase was uh, simul, means at the same time. Eustace, which means saint, et peccator, the Christian who trusts in Jesus Christ at, for, for their righteousness, that Jesus is my performance, Jesus is my righteousness, Jesus is my life, Jesus is my hope. He has forgiven me um, at great cost, and the cost was his, was his holy and precious blood and his innocent suffering and death. It's, it, it, that humbles you into the dirt, and it lifts you up to the heavens. Luther called it a simul justus epicator. You're at the same time sinner and saint. Sinner in yourself, saint in Christ. And this dude, also, you know what's funny is all, that is, all this is, it's not a winsome presentation. 
you know, it's not a preacher trick. This dude that I was talking to the other day, when, when grace descends and the Holy Spirit comes and the Word of God is just given just plainly, it doesn't even need to be, it doesn't need to be sexy, it doesn't need to be, uh, you know, uh, oh, look at this presentation and all this fancy, just meat and potatoes unvarnished. When it's given, isn't it amazing how the deepest parts within us, even though we may not admit it, yearn for that? Like, it, it, it touches. It touches. This is also St. Augustine in the Confessions. He talked about his conversion. And the last phrase in, this is in Book 10, Chapter 28, he says, uh, you touched me. And now I'm set on fire to attain that peace which is yours, which he already has. He begins that paragraph so beautifully. He says, I have learned to love you too late. He's talking to God. Too late have I loved you. (laughs) For those of you who've had a a deep walk with Jesus Christ and, and periods of deepening, don't you feel like that when you're like, Oh gosh, I wish I'd have known this last year, 10 years ago. You do that with relationships, why don't you do it with Jesus? You look back when you meet someone that you really love, you look back on the previous one, you say, what the hell was I thinking with that person? Why don't you do it with the Lord? Augustine did, too late have I loved you, O beauty so ancient, O beauty so new, too late have I loved you. And yes, it is masculine to call God beautiful. (laughs) You know, absolutely. Absolutely. You touched me, and I'm set on fire to attain that peace which is yours. You know, the, I haven't read them yet, but the verses that we're using today in John 1, the gospel writer says about Jesus, he says he, he, he came into the world, and even though the world was made through him, the world did not know him. Isn't that weird? Sad? Weird sad? Not just weird bad, weird sad? And it says, he was in the world, and though the world came through him, the world did not know him. He came to what was his own people, and his own people did not receive him. It's it's the stark truth, you guys, that there's some people that will reject. And and, and in Jesus' day, it was was passionate rejection of who, who he was on the part of Pharisaical works righteousness. And but you know what today's is? Do you want to know what today's Pharisee rejection is? It's not passionate rejection. It's apathy. It's apathy. What do I mean by apathy? It's blah. It's, yeah, I guess I believe in God. Yeah, I guess we'll go to church. That is rejection. That's rejection of him. Lewis was right. As always, C.S. Lewis. You've heard me talk about the trilemma. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. He can't be moderately important. He came to, this is why C.S. Lewis said, the passionate and well-informed and well-researching atheist, the atheist who researches, who wrestles with the text and wrestles with the claims that Jesus claimed who he was, that person is closer to Jesus than the lukewarm Christian. Think about what he's saying. And I think he's hearkening back to, to Revelation where Jesus says, uh, you're lukewarm, I'd rather have you hot or cold. I'd, I'd rather have you cold. I'd rather have you as an honest unbeliever than, a, than a, a nothing Christian. Well, what's a nothing Christian? It's just, that's rejection. They, they, the story I told at first service from Luke chapter 7, we're not going to get into it, we don't have time, but the, the, the woman who fell at his feet and, and, and wept on his feet, you know that story in Luke 7? Go, go read it. It's at the conclusion of chapter 7. It's one of the most delightful stories, I think, in all the Gospels. The, the woman of the night comes in and, and to this Pharisee's house where Jesus is having dinner, balls on his feet. The Pharisee's like, who is this woman? And why is she touching this supposed holy man? And Jesus just takes, his name is Simon the Pharisee, and just goes, whack. Uh, not literally, obviously, but, although that'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> but, it, it, the passage, and this popped into my head while I was preaching at last service, shows us, she, that woman who's unnamed, shows us the posture of what true um, worship looks like. 
and true redemption looks like. Her posture, physical posture. What is, what is that? It, she, she was on her knees crying at his feet and drying them with his hair and anointing his head with, uh, with uh, scented anoint- ointments. Spiritually, that's the posture that we're called to. That's the, actually, that's the kind of life we're supposed to have in him. Like our, our spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus is, is not meant to be meh. It's, it's, uh, it's meant to be dynamic. It's meant to be tearful. I think you guys, trust me on this. Who was, I can't remember if it was Robert Fulgham, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. You should at least once a week at least cry. You know, if, if not for joy, for something else, you should. Um, if you're not, something's not healthy. But to cry at his feet. That woman who goes unnamed, Jesus says to her at the end, your sin is forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Not just your faith has given you a second chance. Your faith has given you another opportunity. Or, okay, the rules were all broken. You were a prostitute, but everything's good now. That's not what he's saying. He says your faith has saved you. And to quote Rose from the Titanic, the famed theologian, Jesus, he saved me from everything that I needed saving from. There's idolatry, which she thought about Leonardo DiCaprio, Jack, uh, whatever Jack, Jack Dawson, that was his name. No, I don't watch that movie frequently and cry. The answer's no. Maybe. But do you see what I'm saying? But that's, that's, uh, that's exactly the point, though, is, is, is that Jesus Christ saved that woman through his impending death and resurrection on the cross and his pronouncement over her, his, his declaration, as we talked about, Kim was talking about declaring, his declaration, your sin is forgiven. That means it's lost its power. Greek word for forgiveness, ephemi. So, it's where we get our word to efface from. What's to efface? It means to take the face off something, to take, and, and what is, so what's, what's, the, what's the word telling us? Is that when Jesus Christ says, your ephemi, your sin is forgiven, for you, for me, for many, sin has a face to it. You could look back on a relationship, you could look back on a script, and it's looking, you could look at it and it looks back at you. And this is why our, our past or our struggles are hard to look at and why maybe going to therapy or coming to church or talking to a pastor or going into counseling is hard because that, they make us look at that stuff that's looking at us. The screw-ups, the, the, the lost hopes, the broken dreams, and it's, it has a face, it's got eyes, it's got a nose, it's got a mouth, and it's looking right at us. And what does Jesus say to her? Especially this woman, she was a harlot. And now he says, your sin is forgiven. That thing that had been looking at you, my lady, it doesn't get to look at you anymore. It's effaced. That's, I almost cursed. I've been with the Marines that, the past weekend. That's stinking Awesome. It's effaced. It's gone. It's, it's, it's absorbed. Martin Luther said, either your sin is hanging on you or it's hanging on Jesus. That's the, it, there's, there's no other options. And the Lord Jesus is looking at some of us here today saying, I don't know why you're hanging it, letting that hang around your neck. That sin, that hurt, that pain, that brokenness, that belongs to me. Now you give it to me. And this is why John the Baptist would say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You give that to me now. You're going to screw that up and that's going to that's take you under. So you go ahead and you, you get in prayer, you get with a group of Christians, and you give that to me. Take that anxiety, take that, hand it over. Hand it over. I could deal with it, you can't. That's why I went to the cross, so that you don't deal with that anymore. I deal with it. And you, my friend, are set free. <laughs> and if the Son sets you free, what does Jesus say? This is, this is his mouth, not mine. If the Son sets you free, what? Love it, church. You'll be free. You'll be, you'll be free indeed. And guess what? When that journey begins, and many of us are on that journey to some degree or another, but some of us got to get on our knees. You know, repent, newness of life. The, the, the road's got to, you're at a, you're at a fork, and it's got to, you got to, the time is here now. When, when Scripture says today is the day of salvation, in other words, it's not tomorrow. It's not next week. It's now. <laughs> Who knows where the Lord Jesus is going to lead you? There's a, I've told this story before, William Williman, uh, and we'll conclude with this. <laughs> William Williman is the dean of the chapel, was the dean, at the chap, dean of the chapel at Duke University. 
Got to see some great basketball, Jacob. There, he was there in the 80s and the 90s. Talk about good basketball. And everyone hated Duke when I was growing up. I always kind of liked them. Is there anyone here who liked Duke when they, when they, Jim? No? Who are, Kentucky? You couldn't root for the Huskies. They were terrible back then, but like, terrible now. Um, but Williman wrote this book uh, while his time at Duke called the, the Intrusive Word. And in it, he tells a story uh, about a young girl. I've told this story before, uh, but tough. There's a lot of you who haven't heard it. <laughs> he had a chapel program there, and his, he, he made it a goal that as a, as a chaplain at Duke to be an evangelist and a disciple maker rather than just someone who holds a position and takes a salary, which is maybe why he's not there anymore. Because they were Methodist. I don't know if they're still affiliated Methodist. UPS was Methodist at one time. But he tells a story in this book right here, The Intrusive Word, about, uh, about a call he received from an irate father. And hello, and he's like, uh, Reverend Williman? Yes, he says, this is so-and-so. He goes, what the hell have you done to my daughter? He's like, What? He goes, I hold you and you alone personally responsible for what has happened to my daughter. He's like, Will goes, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, she was an engineering major with a full ride scholarship at Duke University, one of the most prestigious universities in the entire United States. Good New Testament department too, in their divinity school. And I hold you personally responsible. He's like, what are you, me? What are you talking about? He's like, did you know she's given it all up and is going to change her major? And now she wants to be a missionary and do social work in Haiti? That's what made me think of the story John and I were talking about earlier. She's turning down six figures, her scholarship, what she's worked for, all that stuff, to do this menial bottom rung work in a, the most dilapidated, destitute, poverty-stricken area. Did you know that? He said, no, I didn't know that. He goes, and it's your fault. And Willeman says, my fault? Why is it my fault? He said, you ingratiated yourself to her. You, you filled her head with all these things of, of callings and, and, and following the Lord and and." You, you got her all fanatical. You got her all too radicalized. Not radicalized, that's not the word he uses um, because that comes with another connotation. But she's gone too far is what, is what he's saying. And she's given it all up now and I hold you responsible. And, and, and uh, it's your fault because you got her into these discipleship groups and you gave her these sermons and stuff like that. And Willeman goes, me? Hey, hold on. Aren't you the one that got her baptized? And he goes, well, yeah. And he says, aren't you the one that took her to, to kids' church and, and Sunday services? Well, yeah. And you're the one that took her to church? And, and yeah. And Willeman says, don't blame me. You introduced her to Jesus, not me. And the dad, dejected, you know what he says on the other side of the line? Quote. I have memorized it's not long. But all my wife and I ever wanted was for her to be a good Lutheran. <laughs> he responded, well, you screwed up. You made her a disciple instead. That's what Jesus Christ is after. That's what he wants with you. That's what he wants. That's what he, that's, that's the, as I said last week, that's the game that he's hunting. You know, Lainey, I loved how she talked about how pursuant he is. How he pursues. Go, you could Google it. Go home and Google it. Sir Francis Thompson wrote the most, most epic poem about God's pursuit called The Hound of Heaven. Oh, I fled him, the poem begins. <laughs> Down the abyss, I fled him and I fled him. And he says, and I would feel this incessant pace behind me coming out. 
You see what the gospel is? Our God is not a God who waits for us to pursue him. He unilaterally and preemptively pursues us. And maybe that's happening to you right now. But to those who received him, John says, who believed in his name, he gave the power. Greek word there, dynamis, where we get our word dynamite. Do you know what we're handling here at church? (laughs) Oh boy, if we knew what we were handling, the tiger that we have by the tail, we wouldn't even be broadcasting it. We'd be bolting the chairs down given how unsettled God's going to make our lives when he gets a hold of us in a holy and good way. To those who believed him, who, believed, who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God who were born not of the will, nor of the flesh, nor of a husband's decision, but of God. I'm a child of God. That's what Jesus says about me. We declared it earlier. It is true. Jesus Christ is already declaring it, so we just agree with it. So go forth, children of God. We're going to sing right now. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. We're going to sing a song which sort of is emblematic of this. It's an oldie, but a goodie. And be thou my vision. Thou means, the, the title of the song means God. It's a prayer. The whole song's a prayer. Make it your prayer right here. The song's a prayer. Thou is talking to God. I want you to be my vision. That is, in other words, I want my way forward is I want it to be your vision. My life, I want to see you. My job, I want to see you. My wishes, my, my desires, everything, I want to see you. you. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Don't be all else to me, not be all else to me. Save just what you are. And I, my favorite part, being an athlete, it was, I love this part, um, former athlete, I should say now. <laughs> Riches I heed not. Look at, what's the next line? Nor man's empty praise. Who should we be seeking? Thou my inheritance, now and always. Lord Jesus, uh, let us sing this song as a prayer to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Riches I heed not, nor men's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. You and thou only the first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Join us for our last Advent Wednesday night right here, 6.30. Communion is a, it's a step of faith to take communion. It really is. It's a, Larry Carlson's here. He always says uh, it's the Lutheran version of the altar call, even though we've lost the, the altar, so to speak, right? <laughs> Can't come forward. But it is, it is taking a concrete step of faith, and it's a yes and an amen to God and, his, and to, to Jesus and his love. 
So uh, in communion, we remember, this is scriptural, so it's important to hear these words. We remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is the New Testament. Testament uh, means covenant or promise. The new covenant, which Jeremiah had foreshadowed, which Jeremiah had prophesied, right? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Jesus says, it's here. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, uh, when asked by his disciples how to pray, he gave them a template. Doesn't mean you have to say it every time. It's nice to say it. But he gave us a template, which is we pray for God's kingdom and God's will first. Before we ever get to anything that we want, it's first. That's what we just sang, first in my heart. We get our loves ordered properly, you see? And then we could ask for daily bread and forgiveness of sin and deliverance. So let's pray that prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Emmanuel, Christmas is coming up, 4, 5, 30, and 10. We're going to have three services. We haven't changed anything since last year. Uh, so we're going to have three services. So please plan and bring a, bring a friend Christmas Eve. Join us. Uh, join us. Uh, please fill out, if, if you need prayer or want to learn more about prayer, fill out those cards that we have in those seats there. And we have a prayer time uh, that we have as a community at Wednesdays at 10 o'clock right there in the sanctuary. And we kick it for like an hour. And you should watch the Holy Spirit many times almost blows the doors off of that, bil- b- that building. So join us. Okay, I hope you all are having a wonderful Advent se- a wonderful Christmas season. And uh, let's go forth to stay uh, in the, in, the, in the power and in the certainty of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his never-ending peace, which passes all understanding. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.